Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Whitesley. I'm Technical Director of Envisage UK Limited and welcome to another of our webcasts. Uh, in this particular webcast, I'll be going through Autodesk Inventor Professionals Dynamic Simulation Software. Um, so we'll take a look at uh, a model in Inventor. This is um, part of a uh, floor screed polishing machine. The idea of this machine is that they can take this into uh, buildings. Um, it's designed to go through narrow um, apertures in buildings to get to freshly laid screed and they polish and grind this screed down to what you see as sort of pseudo marble effect on the uh, floor. And we're looking at um, these three devices down here. Um, they fold up so that this machine can uh, go through narrow um, passages and uh, the device we're looking at in Inventor is one of those heads and I'm going to analyze this in the dynamic simulation software. This has got some assembly constraints on it um, but to be, use, but to be uh, honest they're uh, not used in Inventor simulation. Um, but we do have tools in Inventor Simulation to actually translate the constraints that we've used in the design, in the assembly in, in Inventor to the uh, joints that we use in Inventor uh, Dynamic Simulation. So to get there we go to Environments and uh, the Dynamic Simulation button. What that does is it gives us a Dynamic Simulation ribbon and a Simulation player. The player is in two states. It's either in construction or in uh, a run or a simulation run mode. At the moment it's in construction because the construction button on the left hand side here is greyed out. Now as we can see at the moment the parts in the assembly and the sub-assemblies within this assembly are all brought in as, a gro as grounded components. We have an external load which obviously is gravity because this is a real-world simulation that we're doing here we need to take gravity into account we need to take the mass of the components into account and we need to take joints into account and on those joints we need to take into account things like friction and um, strength of, uh, of, of the forces and so on in those joints and torques and so on. So the first thing we can do is take the inventor assembly constraints and bring them through to joints that the inventor simulation software uses. We go to the simulation settings, there's two tick boxes we need to set here. One is to automatically convert the constraints to standard joints, so I'll talk about the joints in a second. The other one I like to do is colour the mobile groups. In other words, it will actually colour the components within the assembly that will be moving and it greys out anything else that's rigid. So if I click on OK on here, what it will now do is it will create us two sets of groups now, a grounded group which is greyed out on the screen on the graphics. Right? This, this is, these are the grounded parts. And then some mobile groups. So we've got the um, bracket at the front here. We've got the main uh, grinding assembly here. And we've also got another sub-assembly which is seen as a welded group. In other words, a number of components that have got uh, full, um, uh, no degrees of freedom between the parts at all. So it's a rigid sub-assembly, if you like. Then it's been recognized by dynamic simulation. So we've got another moving group here. What it's done now is it's converted the assembly constraints in Inventor to joints in the dynamic simulation software. Now it's taken a look at more than one assembly constraint in a lot of instances and converted them to relevant joints. So for instance um, in this area here it's converted it to a cylindrical joint in the dynamic simulation so it can rotate. We've got a revolution joint, uh, uh, and sorry, uh, it can also slide as well. And on the other end, we've got a, a re revolution joint that will revolve only. We've also got a welded group because it can see between the green and the brown components, these are actually welded together. So as the brown one works, I'm going to show you here just by moving this, add a force to this, you'll get a black vector applied to this. So as we move the brown component, then it, it um, links up to this bracket and then the bracket, uh, the, the, the main polishing sub-assembly swings on the bracket here. So now the joints have been created automatically. We've also got an external load which is gravity which is uh, 
suppressed by default, so we've put gravity on, it's in the right direction, so we don't need to worry about that. So we've now got gravity on here. So everything is set um, accordingly. Now one thing that you may want to do, because in effect what's happening here in dynamic simulation is it's taking bodies of certain masses and certain centres of gravity and connecting them all together with joints. And then it uses the maths to calculate forces and accelerations and so on. But you can override the weights or the masses of these groups should you wish. So for instance, the grinding subassembly, if I go to body properties, is calculated a mass. Uh, I'm going to change this to what I know it should be. And this could be, for instance, I may have used um, a frame generator on this subassembly and forgotten to change the skeleton that I've used to put the steel work on to reference in the bill of materials so that its weight's not taken into account or something like that. So I can override the actual mass of this component of, of that supplied by the supplier or that we've actually calculated ourselves. So they can be overridden. And if I play this in the simulation player, gravity will take effect. It will look at all the joints and it will run for the number of seconds that I've got down the bottom here in a simulation player. Remember to go back to construction mode if you know if you ever need to change anything. Now this is just swinging um, due to gravity and the joints taking effect. I now need to start doing some work on this. So I'm going to show you two things that we can actually do in Inventor Dynamic Simulation that are of use to you, the designer. First of all, we're looking at, we're going to take a look at unknown force. Now what unknown force does is it calculates the force, torque or jack required to maintain your mechanism in equilibrium. So for instance, if I want to know the force that an actuator will need to apply to this bracket here, the pin at the top of this brown bracket, to keep the, the weight of this mechanism into equilibrium at any position uh, of its movement, then I can produce a graph of those forces. The way it works is this, we add an unknown force, we choose a location, i.e. the centre of the pin, we give it a direction, flip that because we want that to the direction to be in that, in that direction. Now in this case I know that my piston is always going to be horizontal so I can actually tell it to, to um, keep this in a fixed load direction, it will always be in the direction of this arrow. If I choose the other one, the associative load direction, as this brown assembly moves downwards then the arrow, the force, will actually move down with it. We choose the uh, joint, which is this one here. This is the joint that we're actually going to drive, and I want to drive that to minus 11 degrees. And we click on OK. Now what it'll come up in this case, it's come up to say, look, there are other degrees of freedom. In other words, other joints in this assembly, and you can't have that when you're working with an unknown force. So I need to look at the other joint here and weld it together if you like. So we need to take that joint, right click on it, and there's an option here to lock the degrees of freedom. Okay, so it locks that joint. Now we've only got one joint that will move and we can run the unknown force again. I'll click on the output grapher and what it will now do is it will show me a graph of the unknown force in newtons in this case and there's our graph you can right click on this column and you can search for maximum minimum or zero values i want to search for the maximum force which is going to, which is given me here around 1150 newtons so that's the maximum force required to apply uh, to this joint here the pin at the top of this brown component to keep the whole assembly in equilibrium. So I need to find an actuator that will actually apply a force greater than 1,150 newtons. Very, very useful tool. Okay, let's go back to construction mode again and turn back on the degrees of freedom for the joint here. And remember now, if we just play this, it will just drop due to gravity. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna see we're going to um, simulate this mechanism and I need to find the joint that is going to uh, be driven by uh, minus 10 degrees in this case, oh sorry, minus 10 degrees per second in this case. So if you right click on the relevant joint, go to its properties, 
Now it's showing me one degree of freedom. You'll have a number of tabs along the top here of the different degrees of freedom that this joint actually has. This has one degree of freedom R for revolution. So it's a revolution joint, one degree of freedom. I can add and edit its initial conditions, i.e. what angle was its initial condition. I'll leave it at this value here. I can edit the joint torque and I can edit imposed motion. Now I want to add imposed motion to this joint. So we'll enable that. I want to add a velocity. We'll choose a constant value. And I know this is going to be moving in minus 10 degrees per second. Now if we drive that, that joint will drive at minus 10 degrees per second. We've got a one and a half second simulation, so it'll actually drive uh, minus 15 degrees. Now there's an, there's an error here at the moment, because if we look at the view here, you'll notice there's actually a roller and a pad underneath that roller. And the, the pad should actually be touching that roller, and it's not. As you can see here, all that's happening at the moment is the whole of the green subassembly is moving upwards, being driven by the joint between the grey and the brown components. Okay, but we need some sort of joint between this pad here and this roller. So we'll go back into simulation mode. Now, of course, that sort of thing can't really be added as an inventor constraint, so it wasn't actually converted as we brought this across to the, uh, the simulation software. So we can add extra joints. So we have a number of different joints that we can apply between components. If you click on this button here, it will show you simple videos of what these joints all do. You can even add spring and damper joints, which actually animate and work accordingly. I need a 3D contact joint where we can select two components and tell them that they're going to come into contact. Do the same to the other side here. Okay. So now if we play this, you notice that the subassembly move upwards, moves upwards. The pad then comes into contact with the rollers, bounces about a bit, and then moves up the roller slightly. If we change the time to 1.75 seconds or increase it and play that, we'll see a little bit more. Okay. Let's have a look at the output grapher. Now the output grapher gives us information on positions, velocities, accelerations and moments and so on between joints that were vis visible on this graph throughout the time of the simulation. Don't want the position. What I actually want is the force, the maximum force between the joints that I've just applied. And you'll see here, if I just play this through, we get no force at all until they come into contact a high force as they come into contact, it bounces about a bit and then settles down. And again, if we right click on the column here, we can search for the maximum value and find the force in newtons between the joint, 111 newtons between these two joints here as it comes into contact. That's the maximum force. I want to decrease this by about uh, a third. And to do this, in reality, we would actually change the material of this roller to something a bit softer. To simulate that in uh, simulation, we would go to the force joints, change its properties, and then the stiffness value here, we would, we would alter the stiffness according to the material of this roller. So I'm just going to reduce the stiffness of the contact between these joints. Run the simulation again. The initial maximum force was about 111 newtons. We have a look at the maximum value here, we're down to 85. So we know that if we use a softer polymer on these rollers, we're going to get less of a force between the joints here. Okay, now I want to find out how strong this bracket is, and I want to do some uh, FEA simulation on this bracket. I can actually take all the forces and the torques in these joints 
and send them across to the simulation software within Inventor. And to do that, I need to take, in this case, I'm going to take the maximum force. So when these actually come into collision with each other and the maximum force between the roller and the pad is in effect, I'm going to take the information from that and push those forces and joints, sorry, all the forces and torques in all the joints out to the assembly. Then I can export those forces and torques to particular parts in the assembly. So I'm going to choose this bracket. It needs to know where the cylindrical joint is acting on the bracket, which is the cylinder there. And then the welded joint is actually acting from the shaft to the four faces of the square cutout of the bracket here. That's everything selected. Click on OK. OK, that's everything done now in the simulation. So we can finish this. Go to environments now and go to stress analysis. We'll create a simulation. Now when you're bringing in a simulation from dynamic simulations uh, output, you must select detect and eliminate rigid body modes and you should select motion load analysis. So the motion loads are coming through all the forces and torques etc applied to that the joints on this part are going to come through from that motion analysis at a particular time step that we chose from the uh, dynamic simulation software. To explain what the de detect and eliminate rigid body mode is, because this is in fresh air, so to speak, <clears throat> with just some forces and torques on it, we need to tick this box. Imagine the scenario that we want to do a stress analysis of a buoy floating in the sea. Well, that's actually moving. There's nothing fixed in it, so there's no fixed constraints on it. So we want to detect and eliminate rigid body modes, i.e. we only want to calculate the stress analysis within the buoy, even though it's floating uh, and is not fixed in any way. And that's in effect what this is doing. So OK on that. Now when you bring in this assembly through to the simulation software, it will show all the torques and the forces on the component, but it will show everything else. What's a good idea here is to actually select the component and isolate it so we can only see the component. And then we'll go ahead and do a mesh view of this. We'll mesh it and then actually simulate it. Whilst we're in Inventor Simulation, just to, take, just to make a point of what's actually come out in this particular version of 2013, is that we now have the ability to find, either manually or automatically, thin bodies within our assembly or part. So if you're using uh, sheet metal, anything thin um, in, in comparison to its length and, length and width, you can actually just do a thin body analysis and that will basically take the mid surface and mesh it as opposed to having to mesh the volume and this works extremely well in inventor simulation much much quicker to mesh and more accurate to solve so we would then run the simulation this takes about five minutes so i'll just open up something that we've got already so once we run the simulation let's just put the mesh view on on here and have a look at the von Mises stress concentrations. There's a few things we can look out for when we're doing a stress analysis. First of all, we would go to something like the safety factor and just check to see if the face safety factor was within our limits. And in this case, it's not. We've got a minimum safety factor of a half. So against the uh, yield point of the, uh, of the um, material, we've got a half safety factor, which is not good. And we want to increase, us, increase that to about four or five to engineering or whatever you use in your company. Uh, one thing that's worth looking at when we are working with the uh, stress analysis within Inventor is the convergence. If I go to the convergence results, you'll notice that between two mesh, uh, mesh uh, calculations, the actual maximum von Mises stress has actually gone from 199 to 399 megapascals, which is a bit of a large step. And what we want to try and do is we want to run convergence on this to actually get our results to converge. What we do is this, we go to the button in the mesh part of the ribbon, which is the actual convergence settings, and give it a few, a few more refinements. What this actually does is it automatically refine the mesh in the model 
by three quarters of, um, of its size each time, run up to three extra um, calculations, and it will stop when the last two von Mises stress, maximum values of von Mises stress concentration is within 10% of the previous one. Or you can change this stop criteria if you want to. The smaller the value, the more accurate it will be. So if you actually run that, what that will now do, that will run a number of iterations on the mesh, refining the mesh as it goes, finding the maximum von Mises stress concentration. And then once it's done that, we will then be able to get a curve of convergence, which will actually be um, which will actually start to level off horizontally, uh, whereby we will get a convergence, hopefully, of 10% um, or within 10% of the last value. So we now go to our convergence graph. What's actually happened is on the third calculation, it's actually leveled off and the convergence is now 0.82%, which is superb. So the last two von, Me von Mises stress concentrations were actually within 0.82% of each other. And we can now safely uh, take these results and work with these results. As you can see, the first iteration would not have been a useful one to work with. So that's the end of that webcast. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, please uh, look out for our other webcasts. They are available or will be available shortly on YouTube. Um, if you search for Envisage UK LTD on YouTube, all our uh, webcasts are there. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you.